What's up, guys? Thank you guys for coming out to Sean Aston on Kickstarter Success, a fireside chat. You guys are at the right place at the right time, and this is a very exclusive evening, so we appreciate you guys taking advantage of this opportunity. Uh, I'm Darren Marble, co-founder and CEO of Film Break. I want to start with a shout out to Cross Campus. We are proud members uh, in this co-working space. This is the hottest uh, place for tech and entertainment in Los Angeles, and we're privileged to be a part of this community. If there are any people, filmmakers, technologists, founders, creatives, designers, you guys are looking for a place to work, you will not meet a better uh, community of talented, creative individuals than right here. So this is kind of the eye of the storm. Uh, we love promoting this place. We're proud to be a part of it. So this is a special event for us tonight. Um, we've got an awesome fireside chat hosted by uh, Cross Campus, moderated by Justin Mashin, who's our director of crowdfunding services for Film Break, and of course, Sean Astin. So let's give it up for the team. They're coming out. Seats in front, guys, if you want to jump in. So just a, a show of hands, who, who came to our Crowdfund X event a couple weeks ago in Hollywood? All right, awesome, couple of you guys. So Film Break recently launched a service called Crowdfund X, and the idea is very simple. We want to partner with filmmakers and celebrities to help you more effectively design, plan, and execute crowdfunding campaigns. Um, we're very proud to be working with Sean. This is going to be an incredible event tonight. He's got a very exciting campaign, Start the Vox. The website is startthevox.com. We encourage you guys to pledge tonight. Um, he has reached his goal of $30,000, but the campaign is not over yet. You're going to hear all about it. We've got two computers over there set up where you guys can donate right now to Sean's campaign at startthevox.com. We've got my co-founder and president, Taylor McPartland, who can help you make donations. Um, we'd also like to highlight one of our clients, Stephen Walden, who is the founder of Boss Tools, who just hit his target on Kickstarter of $60,000. Stephen, raise your hand, my man. <laughs> TheNewShovel.com. This guy has innovated a tool that hasn't been innovated in centuries. Um, his campaign is not over yet, so TheNewShovel.com. And now, before we introduce our uh, moderator and our guest of honor, we're going to start with a little highlight reel. And uh, if we could bring down the screen. Get you guys excited here. What your appetite? Turn As if we didn't have enough to do while making the Lord of the Rings. All right. 
So there we go. You guys know who's coming on. I'd like to start by introducing our moderator, uh, Film Breaks Director of Crowdfunding Services. Please give it up for Justin Mashin. Welcome to the stage. And now it is my honor to introduce you guys, uh, a man who needs no introduction, my childhood hero, Sean Astin. That's a lot of responsibility. <laughs> you should let it keep going. <clears throat> that little uh, short film thing is pretty funny. Anyhow. So welcome, glad to have you guys all here. Um, as you know, Sean's running a crowdfunding campaign called Vox Populi. Um, without further ado, can you tell us what Vox Populi is and also a little bit about this civil discourse, what that means. So, <clears throat> the words... Oh, good. Much better. I hate the left. <laughs> can they hear me on the internet? Hello, people streaming? <laughs> What's up? You should come here, it's awesome, you should see what I can see. Uh, kidding! Just nice people. Uh, vox populi, the Latin word vox means voice, populi means people, quite pompous unless you listen to the whole title of the show, the radio show. Vox populi, voice of the occasionally interested people. Um, I, I wanted to do a, a political show um, for as long as I can remember. Uh, my, my mother was the president of the Screen Actors Guild, uh, like her, uh, her predecessor, one of them was Ronald Reagan. Um, she had a morning talk show in LA. I don't know if you guys know uh, the Fox uh, host, morning host, uh, Steve Edwards, but he was her, they were teamed up at one point for a little bit. So I think sometime before my brain was fully formed, I sort of, something went in there that said uh, talk show and, and uh, politics and government. So. You know, one of the things that people have, you know, they, they've sort of, I don't know if they've attributed to me, they've sort of noticed about me, they kind of have described me as being kind of an everyman. You know, Rudy is, is a story of every, every, every team's got a Rudy, you know, and, and Sam kind of represents the best in everybody in, in Lord of the Rings. And so I've got this kind of everyman thing going for me. And, um, and so to kind of, create a platform where um, everyone is kind of invited into it um, is, is kind of what's desperately needed in society right now. We, all of our media, everything's about opposing viewpoints and arguing and fighting, and if you're not 100% expert on something, I mean, most of the people I talk to, they feel very, they feel very kind of squeamish about politics. Either they just don't care, or if they do care a little bit, they feel a little, you know, Oh, you just say the wrong word, buzzword, and bam, you just get hit from, you know, your cousin at the barbecue or from your coworker, and it kind of pollutes everything about your, that space. So people who kind of, a lot of times, play it close to the best. So my, what my father taught me and what I'm really good at facilitating is civil discourse, is the ability to communicate uh, well, to, to express yourself, to share your ideas, to advocate for your point of view without being, um, you know, belligerent, without, without kind of attacking or assaulting, even in, in subtle ways that um, you can always tell in certain conversations when somebody uses a phrase or a way of talking, you can just feel people withdraw. And my mission with Vox Populi political radio show is to, is to create a space and a, and a mode and an expectation where People can come out of their shelves. They don't have to be. Um, they don't have to be pigeonholed into what they. If they have an idea and they they express it and it, they end up disagreeing with themselves later, that's fine. You know, there's there's no uh, nobody's keeping score. This isn't a public campaign. You know, this is a place for people to talk and think about things. And none of us are experts on healthcare. Not you know, but nobody knows 100% sure what to do in Syria. So let's let's bring in a couple of experts. Let's talk to them in a way that invites them not to say their normal talking points. But if you really listen to people and you ask them questions that build on what they've been saying, you can actually get people to speak. You know, we, we only get little snippets most of the time. So this is my uh, this is my mission. It's what we've done. I've done 36 episodes of it, and um, I'm I'm so excited about this 
crowdfunding reality because it's going to make the show better. What are you doing later? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just don't know why. Cool. You guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so now that you know what Vox Populi is a little bit, it's an awesome radio show, all about politics, all about the voice of the people, at least the occasionally interested people. Well, me too. We're all occasionally interested. That's and right. you know what? We, should, we shouldn't have to be more than occasionally interested if we were all a little bit more informed. Not the people in this room, likely, but, you know, if the the public, the body politic was just a little bit smarter than it is, maybe we'd be hiring people who would do a better job than the people who are there now. Yeah, I mean, frankly, I'm the kind of guy who is not that into politics. I don't follow it. Every once in a while I hear something about what Obama's up to on NPR in between listening to cool music on KCRW. So, for me, you know, the opportunity to have civil discourse, the opportunity to have a place to learn a little bit more, but maybe not on the super high level where I don't know what they're talking about anyways, is really cool. And that's one of the things I really like about Fox Populi. I'll, I'll be in a conversation with somebody in an interview, whether I'm, it's my show or I'm appearing on somebody else's show or somewhere else, and someone will say a lot of stuff and then I'll stop and I'll go, wait, do you know what he meant when he said that? And people are like, no. <laughs> it was the whole foundation of everything else the guy said and they didn't know what he meant. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's every... Really, really, really smart people don't know a lot. So it's, I, you know, and my show is just one little, I just am trying to model it on my level. We have 12 to 15,000 people who've listened in to the, on average, to the, the episodes, the 36 episodes. We did one episode on Syria two months ago when the president was asking Congress to vote uh, to support his, uh, you know, a limited attack into Syria. And um, 24,000 people checked it out. And they're not like discovering the show on accident. It's 24 people who found the show and turned it on. Oh, by the way, you can, you can get it on, uh, it's called the Toad Hop Network. The models for how uh, podcasting and kind of broadcasting has is, is really been, it's exciting to see how people have figured out how to put the pen around things and sell advertising space and, and what does it mean. So they basically have a um, 17 shows most of them comedy shows, most of them uh, a couple of sports shows, a couple of um, what's the other one? Uh, 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 movie shows, and then I talked him into letting me do a, uh, uh, a political show. So, and what they do is they basically ha have the room, the microphones, the cameras, a board operator, Johnny Ice is our guy's name, and and then everybody else kind of plug and plays, and then they sell. They and they come with an audience. You know, they work their Twitter feeds and their Facebooks and their everything else, and and they end up kind of bringing a lot of people through that through that portal, through that Toad Hop Network portal. Toad Hop, by the way, is Toad Hop, Indiana. Frank, it's, it's where he, was, he lived in Indiana. When he would drive to work, he'd go through Toad Hop, and there was never anything going on. So he decided he would name his radio network that. Uh, but, uh, but anyhow, so they, and then they find, you know, they sell ads. Now, most of the ads they're selling are kind of totally inappropriate for uh, a, a political audience, but that you, you know, kind of traditionally understood political audience. And I, and I actually don't think there's much crossover. I think my audience is my audience that has come there because I've built that with them um, over time. So I, I'm sort of hopeful that with this, with the, with the kickstarting, uh, Kickstarter money, we'll be able to actually push our reach beyond what we've, you know, I've sort of built Totally. I think one of the really fun and interesting things is you have this radio show that's the voice of the people, and then now you're going to the people to fund this thing. So can you tell us a little bit more about why you decided to crowdfund, why you went to the people instead of maybe to investors and so on and so forth? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I've, I had a film, who knows this, I had a film that I was trying to raise money for. I raised about $850,000. I needed six million, <laughs> so I came up a little short. Um, and th this was a couple years ago, and the laws, the, the securities laws were pretty specific about how I couldn't, uh, you know, anybody that I would go to for a $250,000 investment had to have a net worth of over a million dollars. So the pool of people that I could go to kind of shrank and trying to find, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a challenge. So um, the first time I heard about it, Jake, my buddy, sent me this question right before I walked out here. He's one of the, one of the backers. Um, I got an email from my securities lawyer 
who I had paid a great sum of money to, to help put together the, the, you know, all the securities, the L, you know, all the stuff that you have to have, the, uh, limited, the operating agreement, the securities agreement, everything else. So um, I sort of became an expert in that for a minute. But um, he sent me a thing saying, hey, you ought to check out this thing. They just changed that there's this act or whatever, and, and uh, starting in July, you, there's, you know, crowdsourcing is going to be available. You might want to look into it. So like, it's, just, it's funny to me that the, the first time I heard about crowdsourcing was from my securities lawyer. It's like, isn't that going to hurt your, your business, right? I mean, if we, once, we, once we do that, because then you don't need to. But anyhow, so I, um, but then I started sitting on it. I looked at it. That movie was too big. It's too much money to raise. I was raising $6 million for 11, an $11 million movie. Too big uh, for, that, for that. Even the biggest uh, Mars, I guess, is like $6 million or something. So we, the Kickstarter crowdsourcing isn't that, isn't that, that. I mean, what was Spike Lee's? Spike Lee, I think, was one and a quarter million, mm -hmm. something like that. How much? One point four. One point four. Yeah. So, so, you know, it was too big for that. So then I started thinking, okay, what other, what else is there? Um, and one of the things that I had thought of was this political radio show, and uh, I sort of wasn't ready when I launched this campaign. It was it was premature. I think I had set up my account at Kickstarter a couple months earlier, scanned around looking at other projects, didn't really invest that much time, um, but then realized we had put together this video uh, to kind of put on the website, and I thought, oh, well, that could, be the, that could be the starter video. And then I just, you know, sitting by myself late at night, just kind of, huh, couldn't think of any rewards for people on awards. I was like, I don't know, an autograph picture, I didn't, I didn't quite know what to do there. Um, but then, so it just kind of, it was just there gestating for a while. And uh, every time there's some, you know, political event, something where all of a sudden the whole country or the world is paying attention to something for a second, I, that's usually when I would gravitate a show around. And it was clear that it was about to shut down. I thought, wow, this is a moment where the thing that I want to raise money for is the exact, is like just right on the spine of what's wrong and what everyone is thinking about at this moment. So the government shut down, and I just pushed. Them. I just pushed play. <laughs> I pushed. Yeah, I mean, I'd gotten their permission and everything, but I, I'd gotten their their approval, Kickstarter's approval, but hadn't like weeks and weeks earlier. I just hadn't done anything because I just didn't feel like it was right. Just didn't feel right for some reason. Then the shutdown happened. I pushed the button, and the, it was amazing. The, who, who was deployed right away from that? Um, you know, the first first five or six days, it was like a few grand every day. Couple right. grand, few grand. Yeah, it was pretty great. I love the, uh, you know, looking at these crowdfunding campaigns. Sometimes when you press that launch button, if people are really prepared, right, you'll just see it like a gas meter, except it's in your favor. The money just starts rolling and rolling and rolling, which is really a fun thing to watch. What was that like for you watching it come in? Well, I felt kind of a sense of panic <laughs> because, uh, you know, I'm I'm a known actor. My, uh, you know, when, when I do interviews with, you know, uh, any, any of the big, you know, kind of heavy hitting outlets, that, you know, with Fox or CNN or any of those kind of things, there's this kind of presumption of scope for an actor. You just assume, well, you know, of course you're an actor. All you have to do is push a button and everything, you know, uh, the world will just, un, you know, just roll itself out for you. I mean, that's, and, and that's echoed in the public. People just sort of expect that. Well, that may be true in some actors' uh, experience for certain kinds of movies. You know, Zach put out his thing, bam, just that money just flew in. Right. Had you done Goonies 2, that would have been Goonies a Goonies 2, what you do is good. Exactly right, exactly right. I'm here to announce, by the way, that if you back <laughs> my Kickstarter campaign, I will personally come to your house and act out Goonies too. Okay. At speaking, a certain level. Speaking of which, this is a good time to pull out your phones. Uh -huh. and start the box .com. Start the box .com. But yep. all right, well, yeah. Long yeah. story short, um, and this is something that I want to move into. I want to move into how crowdfunding, how you did it, what worked, what didn't work, so on. One of the things that we did is we set up startthevox.com. So instead of telling you guys to go to Kickstarter, type in Sean Aston, type in Vox. That was huge. That was absolutely huge. That was you, right? Yeah. That's it wasn't just your idea. You trick. set it up and sent me the link and you're like, use this. I was like, okay. 
So yeah, one of the goals of this, uh, of this fireside chat is to really give you guys some nuggets about how to do Kickstarter. So tell me what worked the best for you. That's so funny. They're, they're pushing on their phones, and yeah. every time there's a new backer alert, it vibrates in my back pocket. <laughs> That's awesome. So it's like feel a vision. <laughs> I'll say something cool, my phone will vibrate, and it's just like a total. Uh, it's funny. This is a whole new kind of interactive television. Make Sean vibrate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Waiting. <laughs> I'll raise my hand every time it happens. So if my hand's down for a long time, it's a dud. It's one of these. Ooh. No, but you, you, the question you asked was, how did I feel at the beginning, right? I felt the sense of panic that all of a sudden the expectation or thoughts that people might have wouldn't match up. Hey, thanks. <laughs> with uh, with reality. <laughs> the funny thing is, you can my phone can vibrate, you know, and I can look at it. And it could be like fifteen hundred bucks or a dollar, and you're like. <gasps> Cool, I said just everybody, if everybody did a dollar, my phone battery would be dead because it would be vibrating for, you know, but it would be, uh, so the game of Kickstarter, the game of it, the little, like, you don't get anything unless you get your goal. Um, I, I know there's others that, do, I haven't investigated any of them. I barely investigated Kickstarter. I just like, you know, sort of am marching the beat of my instincts, I guess, but, um, but I felt like I needed, and this goes to your question about like what worked and stuff. The thing that worked 100% above and beyond anything else, in fact, without it, even all the good stuff you guys did wouldn't have made, made a difference, was on this particular project, because it's an actor who's doing politics, which is always an interesting space for people. They love to, uh, they love to deride it until they are totally kind of succumb to, you know, Ben Affleck telling them what to do. Um, I would do a Ben Affleck, I like Ben Affleck. But anyhow, my point is just that I had to work specifically and directly all of the time. On the telephone, Twitter, Facebook, inviting new Facebook friends in, going through my, probably the most useful thing I do is I just open up my Rolodex, my, my contacts, and just started calling everybody. Every single person. And I gotta tell you, after about eight hours of that, you're ready to kill yourself. You, but you have to keep doing it. And I've, I've managed a congressional campaign in the 36th uh, congressional district um, for a special election. My buddy Dan Adler ran for, uh, for Jane Harmon's seat. And I, uh, we were on him all the time. We would do the math. You know, we'd sit down, you've got to, like, you haven't made 10 grand today. Get, get back in the phone. Well, listen, I want to, no, 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 get back in there and call. Find somebody else you know. Call some, somebody, give you 10 grand, go, go get, get 12 from them, you know? And this creepy, icky feeling about government that it's just, like, all about money is, it couldn't be more true, and there's a reason for it. And it's absolutely true in, in the my experience with the Kickstarter thing was I, you have to find a way to, like I don't need a waiter's $25, I'm doing fine. I don't need, I don't need that waiter's $25. The show needs the waiter's $25. If the show can't survive on its own, you know, it's a litmus test, really. Kickstarter's a litmus test for the viability of the program. You don't like it? It ain't happening. You like it? It's happening. And if you can't, and the funny thing is, a lot of times it's a lot easier to convince somebody, you know, a cab driver or somebody on an airplane. I had a great one, a guy on an airplane. I sat down, we started talking, and he recognized me, but he sort of wasn't overwhelmed by sitting next to an actor. And uh, we're, so we're, we're, and I told him what I'm doing. He said, wow, that's really great. You know, my wife is an attorney. And after about 20 minutes, he said, well, what are the, uh, and you know, we're taking off now, and now we're 10,000 feet, ping, and the thing comes out, and I pull out my laptop, and he's got his laptop. He's like, so what are the rewards? And I told him about this cool wristband that I bought when I started the show. And he's like, oh, he said, I wish you could do like five of them or six of them or whatever, for like 150 bucks. That'd be great. I was like, hold on. Create new reward. 150 bucks. Multiple wristbands. Great. I did it. Really? Yeah. Cool. Pull out his credit card. Boom. Beep. Phone vibrated. And we're like, good to go. It was so awesome. Sitting next to the guy. So to me, it's just a very personal, direct contact thing. And if you can't navigate those conversations with people you know and love, you're not going to get anybody else. That's right. Yeah. I really want to point this out, just how much it comes down to you, the project creator, and really, really spreading the word through family, friends, your social network, so on and so forth. I mean, Stephen from Boss Tools, he, he can tell you, you know, this guy was on the phone 24-7. We had to get him out of his comfort zone, 
you know, making calls and working it and working it and working it. And he's at $60,000 now because of it. Um, with Sean, something that really surprised and amazed and excited me was he goes, hey man, I'm contacting everybody personally. I'm sending out personal messages to everybody. He goes, I gotta pay my dues. And I'm thinking to myself, you're Sean Astin, you're from the Goonies, you're from you know, Adam Sandler's 51st Date, so on and so forth. Everyone knows who you are. Why do you have to pay your dues? But you are in it, you're on it, and you're... Because this is new, it's different. Yeah. And it's hard, you know, I, we had, um, I called my publicist, told him what I was doing. We, we put together, you helped, and we put together a, a, a 22 uh, station drive time morning radio thing. And you were amazing. I mean, you, you guys, Film Break, you guys put together the uh, uh, sent specific uh, gra graphics or whatever it was, information to each of the stations so that they could use it to promo the show, which is like, well, that was some heavy lifting right there. I don't know if they did it. I actually don't think they did it. And I also didn't think it would move the knee. Well, this is the thing. It's just like you, you try 100 things. If two of them work, you're like, okay, let's do those two. When you reflect back on it, the other 98 things, you know, they took time, energy, effort, money, but you didn't know. I had a feeling that the drive time radio shows wouldn't move the needle, but you created, Justin created the um, startthebox.com, which made it simple and easy. Actually, at that point, I had Keith Stern, my web guy, do it seanaston.com. If you click on seanaston.com, it would take you right to the, uh, the Kickstarter page. Right. So both of those things were doing it. Ultimately, very, very few people did, a, ha a handful. And we pr I probably, probably, I mean, probably 100,000 or more, maybe a lot more than that, people heard my voice and heard it and probably liked me and thought, oh, well, that sounds cool, that's interesting, whatever. Doesn't move the needle. Yeah. And I mean, what moves the needle is you call somebody, you direct, you know, yeah. you it, uh, reach them personally. Uh, for this, for me, for this project, and to me, the, the you know, it's a question of what, what works and what doesn't work. If, if I could have made the announcement, you know, in such a way, you know, maybe standing on the Capitol steps or something and surrounded by a phalanx of artists and, you know, politicians and then the money would have just rolled in. But no, nope, I put it out there and I got to like grind it out to get it, you know? Yeah. So just to back that up, there's a, there's a rule called the 80-20 rule. And the idea is that 20% of your efforts bring in 80% of the funds. And it can be applied to all forms of marketing. So, you know, Sean really found that reaching out personally was making a bigger difference than the radio. On the radio, no one can press a buy button. No one can press a link. So, one of the things that was working and, you know, Sean... It was great for the show. Yeah. Like, it helped raise the awareness of the show. I'm hoping that we can, now that we've got those radio shows, kind of like their, their Twitter addresses and stuff, when it comes time to launch the second season of the show, we'll, you know... I'm hoping it'll be easier for people to, when it's not going to cost them anything. Because but it doesn't convert to dollars. And that's no, not the in the short term. So, you know, right now, besides the personal outreach that Sean's been doing, we're going to be starting to look for bloggers on a much higher level, trying to find people who can put our, you know, the startthevox.com link on their site, spread the word that way. And I think that we'll start to see some, you know, some major change, especially, you know, people like to write about you more once you're successful. And I think that I'm, I'm curious, and I'm curious for all of you guys to watch, how things change now that Sean has hit the success level and he's got seven days left. Mm. So far, so so far, no change. Right. When I when I pull my head out of it to go do interact with my kids and go to my daughter's play or that kind of thing, it just kind of flatlines. Now it's interesting because I actually think the graphics that you design and these other little like utility things that you put in there, I think they made it's made it. We would not have been as successful without it because it would have direct people there and they. You know, it's funny, people just sort of take for granted that things are going to be the way they're supposed to be. Right. So, and if they're not, because I don't have that core competency to, to, to know some of these little things, I'm not in the crowdsourcing like world, uh, then, you know, I, I probably wouldn't have captured a lot of those people that we sent there to look at it. So, so there's that. The other thing is the project updates, I saw a whole, every time I launch a project update, there's a whole new excuse for everybody to ping you back. They would, everyone would like, all the backers like everything. That's a great thing. Um, it just feels good. It feels good to see that people are liking it. And you notice the pledges, you know, that are kind of reflected. And, and I always put everything, try and put everything right on Facebook and then tweet it out. You sort of get used to that. I, you know what else I thought that we could do? There, I'm only on Facebook, Twitter, and... Uh, LinkedIn? No, no, not on LinkedIn, not on none of those. Pinterest. 
No. Instagram. What if we did a thing where we kind of we did a hey, we're we're pulsing us out, we're successful, but now we're going to push the reach through to those other uh, those other platforms. That could be an interesting little okay. game. Yeah, and you can take the, the Kickstarter backers that you get, send out one email to every single one of them that says, hey, I just joined Instagram, or hey, you know, you guys can now text Sean to 41242. And I think we did that and we got conversions. So that's something, you know, when you convert a Kickstarter backer, you have their emails. You can update them all yeah. and get them to sign on to new things. It's awesome. It's frustrating around six, after six of the updates, I would do little selfie videos did a couple of fun ones, one by a freeway, the other one my daughter did it like in the little Halloween graveyard at our, at our lawn. And it was fun, people with a lot of positive feedback and it moved the needle for sure. Those things definitely did it where I kind of explained where we were at, what we were doing, or some other little nuance. But at a certain point it was like I didn't have, I knew the moment was there for another project update and I didn't have it. And I, and I did one, I recorded it and I just thought, you know what, it's just not good enough. It's gonna, I'll put it out there and it'll just start to feel tired. So I, I was definitely, I would definitely say a, a thing to know about the future, something I want to figure out during this next week is like how to keep at least once a day, at least one good one. Sometimes you can do two or three in an hour if they're great. You know, if you, a news thing just broke, uh, something happened, you know. Yeah, there's an, there's an interesting stat from the guys at Indiegogo. And what they say is that the people who pledge one to five, or excuse me, the people who update one to five times their audience versus the people who do it 30 or more times, it's a 400% difference in funding on average. So definitely, you know, you want to rock those updates. Don't worry about freaking people out or spamming them. They want to hear from you. They gave you money. You know, that's, they signed up to hear from you. So I think there's nothing wrong with that. And I would, you know, even if it's like, hey, I was just thinking about you guys. You know, thanks for pledging. Well, they know I'm going to ask them for money. Right. They're sure. waiting for the hammer to drop and I'm waiting to drop it. You know, I was yeah. like... Hey, three days left. If everybody, I was I actually got my calculator on today, and I was like, okay, so there's 375 backers. If I have 375, if I asked them all for 20 bucks, and they're like, hey, if you all do 20, you know, and you sort of go, okay, that'd be five, three grand, five grand. I don't know. You play these little games with yourself. I guess. So okay, so this government shutdown happened, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're like, I gotta launch this thing now. It's the voice of the people. We need civil discourse, and you press launch. What do you feel you missed out by not having more prep time, by not really taking your time? Is there anything you would have done different in the beginning? Oh, yeah. Lots of stuff. Um, I think one huge thing would be, would be to have the, the media outlets, the bloggers, the, to have a strategy for how I wanted to hit them. Because we spent a lot of time uh, trying to figure it, it felt like we were on our back foot. You know, like, oh, what about that person? What about the other person? And there's some, there's a, there's a quality of, uh, of desperation to it that is probably not as useful as, you know, knowing what you're going to, how you're going to pitch them ahead of time, the order you're going to pitch them at, you know, to tr just try and make it a, uh, an actual tactical, you know, focal point, something that you, that you, you do. That's one thing. Other, the other thing is just making sure that I had gone through each and every one of my personal contacts, relationships. I would have shored up Facebook. I would have shored up Facebook. Um, you know, one of the things is, uh, you know, and maybe, I, we lead, it's funny, for a public person who does so much, I kind of am pretty insulated in my life with my wife and kids. Um, we know a million people, but I don't, we don't have time, we don't, aren't inclined to, to get together with every, at people all the time. We actually live, kind of insular. What I realized is I started a thousand conversations on day three. Hey, you don't want to be a jerk about it. You know, hey, give me money. You know, you're like, hey, what's going on? Are you, is everything okay? How are you doing? Right? So now you're in a, a back and forth, you know, respectful friendship back and forth for five or six things before you like really dig into the thing, you know, hey, well, the reason I'm on Facebook right now, I know you don't, don't usually see me on Facebook, but I mean, that, and then you multiply that a lot, so I think I would have shored up kind of my relationship with people on Facebook so that when it came time to launch, that I could kind of hit the ground running. How many people are you having like active conversations with or have you, have you pinged back and forth once or two or three times? Uh, probably two, probably 200. So yeah, so he's having active conversations with 200 people at a time. Whether it's it made sure, I, the, I felt backers. like my head exploded one night. I was just like, I couldn't sleep. Yeah. I couldn't sleep. I was really focused on it. Part, part of it is because I wasn't comfortable with 
how I was supposed to, it's like there are no rules. This is the wide west. You know, it is, the game is what you can make of it and what you, what you, uh, how you apply yourself. So I, there's a lot slicker, more thoughtful people, I'm sure, who would not have obsessed as much as I did, but I, you know, I just, yeah, it was great meeting you. It was great meeting you. It was great to have my publicist dig in and, and uh, a couple of other people. Linda, who is, uh, I'm sure, watching now as a, as a, as a friend and collaborator and kind of a super fan, steroided out She's super fan. Amazing. She's incredible. She has like a full catalog of my, all the pictures and stuff. I mean, my team were like, do you have something or other? I don't know. Do you have it? Well, I bet Linda has it. So, um, so is it there, and then there's a, a core group of like really loyal fans of mine who, Gina, where's Gina? Gina's right over there. She did a lot of the graphics. Oh, Gina. She's awesome. Nice to see you. Thank you so much. I've seen about 5,000 tweets and 150 <laughs> emails and yeah, wow. That, that's, that's the other thing that I've, um, uh, the idea itself brings a lot of people along. Right. When the idea, like it's the fun and games of the Twitter thing is one thing and it's great and it's like kinetic, but there's, they're there. You know, there's a reason that I'm doing it and I really, profoundly believe in the significance of creating a, 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 a forum for respectful conversation about politics and, and government. I mean, I just think that's really important. And I think other people in and around all the bells and whistles of everything, they, they kind of agree with that too. So depending on what you're doing, if there's people who are in agreement with the, the basic premise of, of what, who you are, they're you know, really vital assets that, that you don't, uh, that you can just kind of, you know, they're just there. So there's, there's a couple things in regards to crowdfunding that you just talked about. One of them is leverage. And one of the things I always talk about is how do we leverage the people on our team, the people who love it, the people who follow it, and so on. And you know whether it's Linda or Gina or me, the more people who come on board on these projects, you know, the more leverage you're getting, the more it gets out there, the more people are reaching out to their social community and getting other people to reach out to their social communities as well. So leverage has been huge. And then just to kind of back up a little bit, you know, Kickstarter, crowdfunding, it's a game. And if you prepare, and if you line up everything in advance, we talk about doing, in CrowdfundX, we talk about doing, you know, 30 days of updates. You know, we have them all planned ahead of time, as much as we can. Obviously some are, come out of nowhere, but we plan that out. Our social media strategy, who we have to leverage, you know, getting people ready to bombard Facebook, so on and so forth, and uh, you know, I'm really excited to work on another crowdfunding campaign with you where we can really dig in at the beginning. Um, but that's I know, just the thing. Goonies 2. <laughs> Goonies 2, no. Um, Whatever it is that we want to do, we should call it Goonies 2. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that would do very well. So, okay. one thing I want to do now is I want to bring in a couple of audience questions. We're going to do a couple from the internet, we're going to do a couple from you guys. So does anyone have any questions to start? And I've got some here as well, because you guys are shy. I know one that I wrote for myself. Yeah. You want to ask it or you want me to read it off my paper? Oh, you read it off. You, you know which one I'm going to say too. But... Um, let's see here. No, not that. Okay, so yeah, okay. So how far, you're a celebrity. Yeah. How, how far are you willing to go to publicize this project? <laughs> um... <clears throat> And how can we get you to go over the line? To <laughs> yeah, you, that, we actually have. This is the relationship. Yeah. You're the campaign manager and I'm the candidate. There you the go. candidate's like, well, I really believe in this. It's like, you're going to believe in that in your house because if you don't do this, you're not getting in the office. Um, I don't know. To me, there, there are just certain things. I mean, I, I have accepted a whole lot of new Facebook friends that I never – you know, that's something I never did before. I actually really never even did Facebook. I had a Facebook account, but maybe two posts a year. I never, I just wasn't a Facebook guy. Uh, but so in the period of time leading up to this, I was doing it and I started just accepting friend requests. Um, and so you, I guess you, be, you get on their timeline. And so I'm like parked at a thing waiting today and I'm looking through and I wanna see if, I'm trying to remember the Facebook post that I did. And all of a sudden, one of the new friends Timeline things popped up, and it was a like a scantily clad girl, kind of large-breasted, you know, with a thing like this, and and I was like, whoa, wow, she was holding up a Vox Populi sign. <laughs> that would that would be huge. 
Yeah, like that's how Howard Stern created a media empire, right? Like he, he just had lesbians in all the time. He just, if he went five minutes without saying the word lesbian, a buzzer went off, you know? And so, so to me, there is, I'm even uncomfortable just leveraging my own, like the movies that I've done. And not, I mean, it's not that I'm uncomfortable with it. I'm just like kind of, if it's done in the right way, it can be great if you parody something or if you kind of invoke something in the right way. But there's a whole lot of stuff that I've done. I just don't, I feel squeamish about it. And then there's, there's other, you know, it's like lunch. We have lunch. For, we, we, I had so many people ask me, like, what would I charge them to have lunch? I'm like, wow, really? <laughs> Thousand bucks. <laughs> 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 so, so actually, I, mean, I never did that. I never did the. Uh, I never did it. But, but I don't know. I, I suppose there's. Uh, you have to look yourself in the mirror. Um, I, I don't know. I will say that you've hit my buzzer a couple times with them. I was like, no, that's not too much. Yeah. Well, Amanda Palmer, she did something that worked really well. When she hit a million dollars for her album, she took a nude photograph like this. It said one fucking million. So if we can get you a million dollars, we can make you do it. <laughs> That's incentive for all the girls and some of the guys in the audience. <laughs> Is that too far? Is that over the line? I think it would look funnier on a short, hairy guy like me if it was like point two, five, like quarter of a million. Right? There you go. <laughs> that would work. At a quarter of a million, I'll take a we'll get you in your hobby mostly nude quarter photo. of a million. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, speaking of you know, like you say that, and you're like, ha ha ha. The, the increments, the average dollar value of the thing of mine has been 87 bucks. Right. At least the last time I looked, it was 87 bucks. You just know there's a guy in a jet who's streaming this to be like, I want to see Sean Astley. There's 250,000. Take it off, dude. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> so um, one of the things that he is willing to do for the right amount of money is go and have coffee with somebody. So if anyone wants to have coffee with You're Sean, gonna facilitate that. I'm gonna facilitate it. Um, it's $500 on Kickstarter. What I'll do How is- How do you value? Go ahead, yeah. Well, yeah, so it's $500 on Kickstarter. What I'm personally willing to do is- I give good advice. Yeah? Yeah, if we have coffee and you need advice, I'm great at giving advice. I don't want your advice. I just wanna ask you about The Hobbit and the Goonies. Okay. <laughs> um, but what I'm willing to do is, if anyone wants to put in 250, I will match their 250 on this campaign. And you, know, you guys can have coffee with Sean. That is so sweet. Wait, I'm waiting for my butt to vibrate. <laughs> right. So you guys want to hear me and let me know. So what are we talking? It's two hundred and fifty. I can just so, feel the internet heating right. up because we did put an input like a meet and greet. Yeah. I can't remember what the thing is. It's like a meet and greet is. It's like a. I don't know. It's expensive. It's like I don't know, but this is a special. Oh, this is a special know. opportunity. It's funny, you know. You say things you're like, "All right, for uh, it just becomes stupid at a certain point. You're like, I want to do a radio show. I want to." Read the news, prepare the news, find really interesting people to talk to, and I want to facilitate conversations between people who have diametrically opposed viewpoints and try and learn. There's one, we did a whole episode on the Congressional Budget Office. Raise your hand if you know what the Congressional Budget Office is. You're such babies. <laughs> Raise them high. <laughs> I promise not to call on you. The, Congre the CBO is the Congressional Budget Office, and if you uh, have ever watched a congressional, a presidential, a senatorial uh, debate, or ever watched uh, commercials for any of those things, they always refer to the Congressional Budget Office or the CBO and the numbers that they score. Nobody knows what that is. So I spent two hours on it. I got one of the former heads of the CBO on. I got out a map. I showed like, this is a building. If you walk down past the Senate, the Hart building and on Capitol Hill, you, this is it. They have a $147 million budget. They have, a, or they, they or no, it's a $47 million budget. They have 147 PhDs. And then just talked about how, how do the, um, uh, the, 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 sub, the committee chairs choose when to uh, commission a study for the farm bill. Right, and, you, and we went through two hours of this, and I swear, and it was one of the low, it was probably 11,000 people, it was one of our lower rated shows, but those 11,000 people will never watch a debate the same way again, ever, because now they know how it's politicized, they know how and when they use those numbers, so the way a candidate frames what they're saying, or how they invoke those numbers, or how they try and beat their opponent up with them, they're, they're, we're, we're all, I'm, I'm better educated about it, they're be better educated about it, this is what I wanna do. So like, yeah, have a cup of coffee for 500 bucks, cool. Have a, you know, whatever it is. I just, that's what I want to do. And I, I need a producer. I need somebody to focus on social media. So, and I need somebody to help us with booking. 
and uh, somebody to help us with research. That's what I mean. I'm not getting paid in. This is a hobby for me right now. If we can get the show to be real big, going downstream, then you know we'll. Uh, it'll be great to to have advertising to work with and to upgrade the whole show. Maybe do a T. Who knows? The, the sky's the limit with this premise of civil discourse. So anything can happen with it. Do you want to be on broadcast or radio, like broadcast radio or TV? Is that somewhere you'd like to see it go? Right now, I want to make my stretch goal of sixty thousand dollars. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's a great point. One thing I've said, I've been known for saying this before. I've been in meetings with publicists talking about campaigns, and I say, listen, excuse my language on this, but I say, listen, I don't give a fuck about what happens after 30 or 60 days. I don't care what happens after this campaign is over. All that matters to you guys, all that matters to us is this damn campaign and bringing as much money as we can in. So that's all that matters. When you guys do a campaign, all that matters is right now. It's bringing in the money, because once you have the money, you can use it, you can budget it, you can make it work for you and do your, the, the project that makes your, you know, You've got a well. huge future in this, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it does matter what happens. I remember we, I was at that PETA event and Pink got up and she's like, it doesn't matter what you say, just get up there and say it. And afterwards I'm like, Pink, it matters what you say. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to say that. I, I generally preface that statement with I'm just about to say something that's not actually true. No, it's what your point. Your point is absolutely important. take. You have to be focused, and you have to. If you don't, uh -huh. if you, we're in agreement. That's like, what's my big goal? My big goal right now is getting sixty thousand dollars. Because the other thing I want for the show is an app. When anybody says, "Oh yeah, how can I find your show?" Oh, download the app. You want to call in? There's a there's a, a feature on the app. You can just call in. You want to submit a comment to the show? You can submit a comment. Oh, hey, there was. A, I want a list of the people who've been on the shows, and then I can punch right up there. I want a, like a really robust, cool app, and it costs money to do it. And uh, we're, and if we don't, I, you know, I don't know. We need it. So if you're listening out there on the internet, uh -huh. my phone is vibrating. Thank now, you. <laughs> one thing I one thing I want to say about that too. Had I known about this campaign earlier, had I gotten involved earlier, one of the things we would have done is we would have done screenshots of the app. We would have showed people what this app is going to look like in advance. And that's something I want you guys to think about too. Is how do you visualize what you're trying to say? Um, when we first started working with Sean, all it was was a bunch of text and a video on the page. And, you know, we did our best. We didn't put in as much time as I would have liked, but... You did great. You know, cool we, got, we got some visuals in there. And the whole idea is, how do you visually tell a story to help get people to go to the right and press the pledge button? Um, and that's really important. And I think that, you know, had we had more time, it would have been really cool to show what this app looks like and even, you know, push this thing from the technology angle, too. Because what you're talking about to me sounds like a whole new realm of technology for radio. I can press one button, you know, and then press one other and be on the phone with you. Or I can be watching you or plug you into my car. I don't need to tune the station. It's there. It's what I would want, you know. So I think that's killer and I can't wait to... <laughs> Please yeah. back the show. That sounded so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's get into 60K, guys. Let's do it. Um, love it. Um, I got a question. Yeah. Any questions for me? Any questions on what you would do next on, you know, what we've done so far as far as crowdfunding? Well, I'll flow a question out of this. But what I want to say is that um, leadership and team building skills are critical. Because you talked about bringing in all, you know, people. You said bring in more people. Uh, as many people as you can who have a, you know, there's the ethos in a space like this is like, hey, everybody's working. If you can get up and go help that guy over there, you'll help him, he'll help you, you know, 10 years down the road when you're, you know, driving your Beamer and that guy's there, you'd be like, oh, right, and you keep, who knows, that's how the, that's how the world, world works. But everybody's in their own, you know, everybody's got their own life going on. And some people may have a core competency or some skill set that is critical, mission critical. But they can't be, they can't call in to the dial-in number and, and do 45 minutes listening to people talk about different things. So figuring out how to communicate effectively with that person and then how to have that, I mean with me, I, listen, the best thing is if you just have perfect people, you bring them in and you just trust that they're gonna work it out and if something goes wrong once in a while, you just kind of put it, put it in the right uh, direction. But it really does require a sensitivity to what people's issues are and you know thinking that, that and that's something to think about ahead of time too you know ooh, I think I'm gonna want that person to help me with this media stuff and I'm gonna want that person to help me with that I want to make sure they're gonna be cool with it 
So when you put your team together, I mean, I put my team together like we were all set on fire running out of a burning building. I mean, it was like, but, uh, you know, I would, I would think that's something I would do different together too is, you know, take, take a lunch, take a meeting, have a good long phone call uh, with somebody, make sure that they understand what my goals are and talk, talk about how I want to plug them in with the team. Then the painful thing is if the team, if there's some, something that, that isn't working, you know, and identifying that that's not going to be helpful and, you know, finding some way to resolve it is uh, something that I think, particularly in a short campaign of 30 days, you have to, you have to be willing to do. You have to sort of go, that, that isn't working. Because once you, and it's not just like if this person's good at doing something or not good at doing something or says they're going to do something and they can't do it or doesn't do it or doesn't do it the way you want. It's not just saying like you're done. Once you've linked everybody together, it creates a deleterious sinking feeling with everybody else if you know you cut that person out of that job. You have to kind of find a way to, to yeah, just be, be a, a leader and a team leader. And I guess, I guess what I would ask you is, where in the dot-com era, you could just see it. Things were just this tidal wave of new opportunities and, and you know, kind of people hustling and everything else. This is a new frontier, and you guys are pioneers in this area. But how do you give a guy like, like uh, me or any celebrity who would come to you for business any sense of confidence that you're going to, like, stick with it? You're going to stick with and be focused, you know, that you're not – that so many great opportunities are coming along every second that as soon as they sort of cast their lot with you, that they're not going to – the uh, you know the, 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 that relationship is going to mean something. Right. I mean, the first thing is that we care about the people we work with. I mean, we reached out to you because you were authentic. You know, your campaign looked good. It was for a good purpose, and so on and so forth. I'm going to quote Darren, our CEO, on this and say, ABQ, always be qualifying, and that's something we're all about. You know, Filmbreak isn't just a distribution platform. It's not just a crowdfunding solution. It's a, it's a sales engine, and one of our big things is qualifying and when we bring in a new lead or somebody who wants to do a crowdfunding campaign, is what they're doing important? Does it matter? Do they have the social outreach to actually pull this off? Are they going to hit their goals? So on and so forth. You know, Steven was an amazing guy. This was one of the most hardworking guys that I've ever met. And having a chance to work with him and give him guidance and direction, it was an absolute pleasure. So for us, it's all about qualifying and knowing that what we're doing is worth our time and that we have the time to put towards it. And so it's choir and so forth. Um, I think that's the key right there. Well, you're, this, the way that we met, I launched. That's all right. We'll go ahead and watch. Is that the Kickstarter? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. Hey, can you we show them the parody? Can you show them the parody? Yeah, we can. All right. This is top secret. Um, Not to be broadcast. I think, I wonder, how do we do that with the online people? So we're going to do this. It's going to take like two minutes for them to set up, but my laptop is the broken one over there. Nice. If you guys can plug it in, the parody is... Oh my there. gosh. Redundancy so, with equipment. Yeah. I, in the middle of doing stuff with my with my, the campaign, my, my computer froze. I had like maxed out the memory doing this video thing and, and uh, <laughs> you're like, it's like, what if... I, it's just rough. It's rough to, to have a computer go down when you're in the middle. When ever it feels like everything is hinging on your fingers, so it's good to have. Let's do this in the meantime while they're pulling that up. Um, there's a question on the internet for us. Yeah, a couple questions. Okay. Uh, one: How do you keep a level head with some of the uh, conversations and guests that you've had on the show? So, uh, the person online asked: How do you keep a level head with all the different people who come on your show? With people who maybe piss you off or try to piss you off or who you know, who aren't saying what you want to hear. So how do you keep a level head? Well, people get extremely passionate. I can say one word right now, and then it's going to light up that thing like a Christmas tree, depending on how I, what, how I inflect that word. Obamacare. Can you feel it? I tried to say it all neutral, but anybody... Online, it's like, oh, that lefty liberal, he's, you know, he wants socialism and, you know. <laughs> um, it's a discipline. And I, it's a, I, th I think it's actually an innate kind of God-given gift that I have. But really it was nurtured in me by my father, which is to put yourself in the other guy's shoe. And I try not to question the intentions of the person who has 
a divergent viewpoint. I try and really understand what their viewpoint is. Might not change mine, but really understand it. Um, and once I fully understand, and I, you never get to full understanding, once I, once I understand it as best I can, then as a host, it's my job to then try and understand that person's viewpoint. So listening for people's anger, um, for their, their bias, you know, and, and having a, a kind of an empathy for where it likely comes from is really important. And, and also knowing that I have a gift to give them. You know, if somebody's in pain and you can give them something, that's great. So if somebody calls in and they're just, you know, fire-breathing dragon about their issue, they clearly have something going on with themselves because, like, this is a, a small radio show. They're not talking to a legislator, so there's no reason to be upset. All there is is an opportunity to communicate. So the gift I have to give them is a platform. You, you know what? Listen, now hold on. Before you say something like that, before you, you know, what I get out of the way you just said that is that you, you know, you, whatever. You just find a way to refract back to them how you're interpreting their experience or to just stop them if they're, if they're too angry. I tell people we only want like sevens and maybe eights on the anger meter. If you're a nine or a 10, we're gonna be like, okay, you know what? Go, take a walk, come back, it's a two hour show, come back, when you've cooled off, call back in, I'll be thrilled to take your call, and we'll, we'll, we'll dig back into how, why you feel that way, you know? And if the reason somebody feels so passionate about their pro-life stance is because somebody had an abortion in their family, and because this, that, or the other thing, let's talk about it. And let's, let's try and connect those ideas. Your emotions and your power and your belief and your strength, okay? And now, let me give this person a chance. And what you have come away with all the time is, everybody does, is once, once that person has had the opportunity to fully express themselves, and you can do it in three minutes. If I said, what, is your, what are your thoughts on healthcare? Go. It's gonna be hard for you to talk for three minutes, unless you really know what you're talking about. And then maybe after five, you're wiped out. <laughs> you know, and, but once somebody's had an opportunity to really express themselves and they feel like they've been heard, that person's more receptive to hearing what the other guy says. So I think it's a discipline, it's a, it's a sensitivity, and it's a mission. I have a very powerful sense of mission that by doing this, by hosting this kind of show and providing this kind of forum, I'm, I'm modeling both within the context of the show, but then for anybody else as they move on, the, you know, the right way to be. And by the way, you know, I, I can get furious and scream at people too, but on the show, I have a, I have a job. I have a, I have a responsibility to the idea of the show. So it's, you know what, it's also one of those things for me where because I, I'm such a news junkie and I devour everything I can and I try and learn, I try and understand, and a lot of times it doesn't go anywhere. It just dies inside of me and it's like, that sucks. So to have a platform to do that and know that 12,000 people just heard what my ultimate thoughts are on this uh, and then create that ability for other people, it's just a great thing. I said the guy, the guy goes, the guy writes, he goes, hey, why don't you do something with what the fox says? So I, I had never heard of it. I looked it up, 125 million hits. Okay, Gangnam Style, let's do it. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I, fly, I, I call a buddy of mine. There's this group called the Star Kids. I was gonna ask, who were those guys? The Star Kids have a, well, I was at a convention. I go to the, these science fiction, comedy, comic book, whatever conventions. And I was at one in New York or Chicago. And there was all these like really cool actors and authors and people you know and love and and uh, you know everybody. I had a cool line of people and this person had a long line of people and that person had a line of people. And then there were these people like right next to us. Their line went down, all the way down to the edge of the like convention hall, out and around the block. And you're like, who is that for? And they're like, oh, that's the Star Kids. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> the Star Kids. So they come running in, twelve of them dressed in costumes like actually no they weren't dressed at that point it was later that they were i saw them on their like superhero costumes but basically they were there and i walked over and i was like you guys are awesome they're like so much gift she knows us you know they're like right on so uh, we took pictures together and i went out and hung at their their panel and we just became friends and they had a, a play that that um they they 
kickstarted in Chicago and I helped them with their Kickstarter campaign, just sort of promote it. It was a great play and they're fantastic. And now a bunch of them, those guys are uh, at Second City. So I just called Joey, the one who's in the room, and I was like, Joey, what, what do you think? I, and he goes, sure, great. And I was like, I'm going to Chicago. Maybe maybe we could, I could get the guys there. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like Friday. I was leaving on Saturday. <laughs> so I flew. I think I took the red eye. And when I landed, I don't know, whatever it was, all I know is I hadn't talked to a soul. And it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I was like, Meredith, can you meet me at to the concierge at the hotel? Like, where's a good place in Grant Park to do like this uh, video with a thing? And the guy's like, well, I don't know, maybe uh, Blur Street? I'm like, great. Can you meet me at Blur Street or whatever? Sure. How's everybody coming? Oh, different ways. We'll be there. Great. I have a something costume, a this costume, a that, and a, and a shark. I was like, just one shark? <laughs> so, so I stopped at Best Buy, picked up a GoPro, and uh, showed up, and there they were, standing in the corner with all their... Oh, and the other thing is, did you see the, uh, the, the, the uh, robes? I didn't have a belt. And I was like, I need a belt. I'll just take one out of the hotel robe. So I open it up, and there's a zebra robe and a leopard robe. And I was like, I'm going to use those. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 yeah. That's super cool. Isn't that great? Yeah. I remember hearing about this thing. Sean's like, I'm going to do this video, this music video from the song that's on YouTube. And I'm like, and you're going to get it done when? He's like, yeah, it'll be ready on Friday. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, well, you're Sean Aston. You know how to make a movie. And he got it done in no time. And I'm, I'm awesome. always impressed. It wasn't that hard. It was, you know. I had to buy a GoPro. Yeah, there you go. You had to film it, you had to do post, and you had to get, you know. We got that much music going on. All right, so we've got another question from the, from the internet. What is uh, it? A couple questions. First one, is this your first time cosplaying from someone else's video? So, is this your first time doing a parody of someone else's video? Cosplay, bro. It's Cosplay. A Cosplay's a thing. So this is cosplaying? Um, no, but the person right. on the internet thought it was. Well, yeah. yeah. So, um, yes. Okay. This is your first time. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And, okay. And more serious question. Um, uh, would you add a live chat room uh, to your show? And are there any pitfalls with that? And secondly, would you use, uh, would you crowdfund a third season or would you search for separate uh, ways of uh, fundraising? Finance? Uh, good questions. Yeah. So the, the first one was... Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, would I add a chat room to the, <laughs> my first thought was, if I had more money, I could hire a guy to run it. I'm happy to have it happening, but like, my head's exploding trying to think how to do it. Yeah, if there's, I'm, I'm guessing, tell me if I'm wrong, but if you had somebody who could help manage that chat room, you'd be all about it. Oh yeah, of course. That's the whole point. And it's generally something that, that what, what are the downsides to it? The downsides are that I wouldn't be able to control with my voice, the tone. So what I would try and do is, and, I, and it actually is time consuming, it happened during my interview over here, right before the show, is somebody uh, just started kind of hammering away at something, I'd, they clearly hadn't listened to what I had said, and, or they just were kind of you know, reacting based on what they're feeling about healthcare or whatever it was. And so I took some time, even during the interview, while we were scrolling through the chats to address the person, and there was a delay, so it was annoying, but, but tried to address it, and, and basically I know that if I would have had him on the phone in person, it would have taken about 45 seconds to a minute until we were in agreement about how to proceed, and then he'd have an opportunity to say what he wants, and he would have definitely had a less aggressive tone. Because you could tell from the type of person that he was that he, that he, he could be cool as long as he felt like he, was, like he was being heard. People just want to be heard. That's, you know, I have people, you know, oh, Sean Aston, just, I just want to, I want you to know I exist. You're like, all right, I know you exist. <laughs> you know, it's like we need, somehow we need to get into a spiritual conversation right now, but let's not go there. But um, the, the, the downside of doing it would be um, to constrain, to, to nurture the civil discourse. And what happens is when other people try and police each other, which is fine, but when it's connected to a show, it happens with Twitter. You know, somebody will make a comment and I'm on the show and then I'll see there was a huge back and forth between people and, and ultimately it was somebody said something rude and they didn't apologize right away. And so, okay, that was a distracting period of time. One of the great things about the show is it teaches us how to like quickly resolve the wrongness of an exchange and get to like the meaningful differences. Um, so I would be all for it, 
that would just be one challenge we'd have to figure out how to navigate. And in terms of raising money via Kickstarter for a third season, I'm considering doing Kickstarters for other components of the show. Um, so I don't know, you know, the, the most important thing now that we've succeeded at 30,000 is to deliver what I said I could deliver. That, you know, you, uh, uh, that all of the, uh, you, there's fulfillment on all of the rewards. That's the first thing I'm gonna do, is any of the rewards that I can fulfill immediately, I'm gonna do that to build goodwill with the people and also to draw more people in, take pictures of it. You know, with all the Vox Populi bands that I have that's selling out, I think there's like, I don't know, however many of they're going out and just make it a fun, personal process so that people are, it's not just so they feel included, it's so they are included. And then, and then, and then make sure that we, I, and then the hire. The hire is, is gonna be a big deal, the, the producer. I think I'll have enough money to hire at least one ha you know, part-time producer, maybe one full-time producer, and then maybe we can bring on an intern or two. Or, you know, putting the team together with the money that I have. So that process, I've been t people have been asking me, I say send your resumes to, if you wanna produce a show or um, you know, social media expert, research skills that you wanna contribute to the show, whatever. Sean Astin, Vox Populi at gmail.com, and I ask people to send in a one minute um, introduction to themselves on video, as well as their CV. Um, so that's gonna be, I think I'll make that a kind of transparent process. That could be kind of a cool way for people to, to feel uh, like they've, they're controlling how the show is gonna shape things. And then, and then going forward, I don't know. I mean, Justin and I are gonna figure out how to run the world via Kickstarter, so, you know. <laughs> So I've got about three questions left. The first one I have to ask is on Linda's behalf because Linda has been amazing. Yeah. And if I don't ask it, it's not right. So Linda, this one's for you, or this one's from you, I should say. So if you could hold any political office, local, state, or national, what office do you think you would you would give you the personally? Uh, what office? This is back. Congress. Congress? You yeah. go for Congress? Absolutely. It would give I've always said that since I was a little kid. Is that where you think you could affect the most change? No, nope, I think probably a radio show could affect more change than an individual congressman. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but that would be a role that I would, uh, I would have, you know, that if, if, I, if I had my druthers. I used to tell people I didn't want to, I wanted to be in government. I didn't want to run for government. But I didn't understand why it was important then to run for government. So I don't know that I would ever do that. But if I did, that would be it for sure. Cool. So my last question, I'm going to ask Thank you, you Linda Iroff, for that very insightful question. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Linda. Um, so the last question I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask something first, is what would be your advice for everybody in the audience and everybody on the internet? Before I get to that, though, I want to know a summary of from start till now, you know, the stresses, <laughs> how it's felt, and then now that you've been in it for you know for three weeks and you're getting on to your fourth week, how do you feel now, knowing more and having more experience? So, just if you can summarize where you've been and where you're at now with this case yeah. experience. Well, first of all, the shape of the Kickstarter campaign, my inaugural Kickstarter campaign, is absolutely a memorable experience. It absolutely is, has required much of my thinking and spirit uh, to, to be committed to it. So I, I did not come to it like, I never go to anything lightly. Anybody who knows me is like, like dude, it's jello, just eat the jello. Um, so, but my, my point is that I, everything means everything to me. So I sensed opportunity I cautiously investigated, not enough. I didn't investigate enough. I didn't, didn't research Kickstarter or crowdsourcing very much at all. I just sort of went on instinct that what it is and what it was. Um, so there's other companies besides Kickstarter, Indigo, with all those, you know, okay. all those companies and everything. So people, you know. But um, I'm grateful to Kickstarter. But then I felt determined absolutely determined when I pushed the button. And then I felt like a sense of uh, kind of, uh, 
you know, panic. Like I said, I felt a sense of panic and a sense of mission going forward to a point where, you know, I, I realized when we did um, Memphis Bell and they did the, the, the war training for us. They sent us for two weeks with these SAS Royal Marine guys and we didn't get to sleep at all and barely ate anything and we were marching and going in mud and, you know, doing all, these, all this kind of stuff that you do to train people. And it, we, what I realized then, and I was 18, fired up, ready to go, is that it really only takes about 36 hours to break someone, physically, where your mind and your body are just like shut down. Um, so, and I experienced that on this after about seven days, <laughs> where I, I was, you know, I went to sleep with the computer on my lap, and then I wake up and I'm trying, and I couldn't, I, I couldn't extricate myself from, from it. Um, so that was exhausting, and I felt defeated in that moment. I was still another, I don't know, whatever, $10,000 away from my goal, and I could tell that barring some kind of, you know, clever exchange with somebody somewhere who could drop 10000 that that I was, you know, I felt a personal sense of uh, defeat. And then I kind of gathered up my energy and launched back into it. You know, you came along, uh, other, other members of the team came along. It was a huge uh, help to have, to have people to email and to know that certain things that I was obsessing on were being taken care of. Um, and, to, and to just have some of the other things. You know, you, you, uh, it's like I was lifting the thing up the mountain and you were like, oh look, there's an elevator, just do a link like this. And you're like, oh, okay, cool, man, thanks. Um, so, and that freed up a lot of space. So n then when we reached the goal, it was an interesting moment. I was actually at a, Lear, at a private jet hangar in Vegas on the way back from a Rudy 20th anniversary thing. And uh, a guy was nice enough to send it, you know, let me ride in his jet. And he was dropping me off on the way back to Oregon, sort of whatever. He, he's like, sure, I'll drop you off. Um, most of the time I'm on Southwest. But anyhow, the, uh, and he, he and his wife just kind of put it in and added 1500 bucks and put me over the top. And I like, obviously at that moment, it's total elation and it's thrilling. And there's, a, and then I, I slept for 12 hours. <laughs> and then, uh, and then I woke up and I started, I was like, oh no, no. And I want to get, I mean, I had the stretch goals ready in my mind. So we put the stretch goals out there and then I, I just thought, uh, you know, so it's, it, I guess the whole point of this that I'm narrating the beat by beat thing is that it's an emotional process that you are totally invested in and it, has to do, uh, and this goes starts to go to the advice to people online or whatever. When you do a Kickstarter thing, two, you have two things. One is, you know, be bold. Be bold. Try, you know, if you think it should be a Kickstarter campaign, and you know, better than even chance is it is a good idea to do a kick, you know Kickstarter campaign for you. The second thing is realize that it's going to affect your relationship with everyone you know. This isn't something you kind of do off on the side. So, come holiday time, when you're sitting there, people say, hey, how are you doing? Well, you might have worked your 40 hour job and you might have done this and you might have done that. Um, but really what everyone want, would want to know is, how's the Kickstarter thing? Oh, I failed. Oh, I'm so sorry. Then you have to live with that. Or, oh, it succeeded really great. What do you do? Then you get that. So, but it affects your relationship with everybody you know. And if, it, and if you're not ready for that, then don't do it. Wait. <laughs> Um, and I, so I feel a sense of, it feels like the 60,000 is really far off. You know, by the, by the time, when we started, I was banging out two grand, three grand a day. And then as long as I, in the, in the kind of slow going days, as long as I reached a thousand a day, I was like, okay, if I can get 10 people to do 25 bucks, that'll get me over where I am now. If I can get 15 people to do 20. So now... 60,000 feels far away, but I feel like I'm, I really want that app. <laughs> right. So it's going to animate me to keep doing all this good press stuff we're talking about. And, and then, you know, finally I get my little dream, which is to do the show. Cool. How's, your, how's your stress level now? I know that when I first started talking to you, it was a lot higher. Right now you're sitting here kicked back. You look good. So how, <laughs> how has it changed just learning a little bit as you've gone? How are you feeling now? Well... I don't think I have a naturally hysterical personality, but I am kind of, I do get keyed up. Um, 
having relationships with experts. I mean, you guys are out here, but you could probably only deal with so many campaigns. I mean, how many campaigns are, are there going on? I mean, when I scroll through it, it just seems endless. So, you know, I'm sure that a lot of the people out there who have campaigns would really benefit from just certain little things that are easy for someone who does it all the time, but would mean the world to somebody who didn't. So finding some way to make your kinds of skills available to people would be great because the second I felt it, I, it relieved a lot of stress for me. So reaching the goal relieved a lot of stress for me. Um, and, and also having realizing that, I mean, I have certain advantages. I'm blessed. I've got, I've got a successful acting career for 30 years now. Um, and so that's a lot of visibility, a lot of relationships, a lot of that. So probably if I was a little smarter and a little more patient, I could sit down and figure out how to approach some of the many, many relationships I have in a more, uh, you know, in a way that would yield a lot higher dollar, dollar return. For me, it's like I'm, I kind of like the shoot from the hip, you know, grassy rootsy thing. Just, I just like it. I feel like I'm, I thrive, I excel in that. So I feel like at the moment, thanks to you and Linda and David Lust and Keith Stern and all the, all the folks who've helped us out, I think I'm, you know, sitting pretty. And I'm, and I'm getting a little bit more, um, I'm refining those conversations. Not, I, I, I did a lot of heavy lifting early on with the conversations. And it's not just about the pitch, because the premise of the show and why I'm doing it are pretty clear, and I can say it in 20 seconds or 40 minutes, but like reaching each individual person and trying to figure out like what's, what's fair exchange with people when you ask them for their dollar. I think I'm getting a little bit more sophisticated about that, and the, the more sophisticated I get, the less stress I feel. We'll start winding down. I do want to give anyone in the audience you know, one final chance to ask any questions. I'm going to start right here in the front. Uh, no, just go ahead and say it. I'll read it. Um, I read recently on Twitter that it used to be that when someone contacted you, you hadn't heard from in a long time, it was AA and they were apologizing about something, and now they want you back for Kickstarter. Ah. So I was wondering with the hundreds... Yeah, and then you'll be apologizing for that in 10 years. <laughs> um, so with the hundreds of conversations you had, exchanges on Facebook, have you hit it? on any strategy or approach that was most successful in turning someone into a backer? Have I hit on a successful strategy for turning someone into a backer when they're a friend or a contact or something like that through Facebook? A phrase that seemed to have really ring a bell with them. Um, well, the, the word authenticity is really critical. You know, I think people appreciate it if you ask them something directly, um, you know, kind of beat around the bush about it. So it's really hard, you know, this is why politicians get such a bad rap. It's because they, they grind through it so much that they know, you know, in the pull down menu in their mind, that caring about your kids is probably something that like a good person would do. But the way it comes out is like, oh, hey, how are your kids doing? Can I have a $500, you know, whatever. It's like, it doesn't, so I think, my, you know, learning curve has had to do mostly with really trying to make sure I don't do the wrong thing there. I don't apply my energy the wrong way at friends or family there. Um, a specific, I mean, this is what I was just saying. It's about ref refining how you do that. Um, you know, at first, with all the first 150 backers, I went into each and every one of them. I wrote an, I wrote an email that said, you know, hey, listen, I, every single backer who does this, I want to have a direct relationship with. And so far, of the 25 people who've written me, I've written back every, I have a conversation going with every one of them. So please know that this is, I'm cutting and pasting these words out and putting them personally in your, you know, thing. And I would love to have a conversation. So I did that. I sent them out to like 200, right? And so like being honest and trying to create context for what you're doing. I think if you find the thing that works, you can you can do it as a Facebook post that everyone will see, you know, and people follow. But I must say, of of a lot, most of those conversations didn't work. I think they were important, 
I think they taught me about myself. I think, you know, my relationship with those people are all a little bit, you know, they have that now in common. But something happens. You hit your cruising altitude at a certain moment. And it happens when you're at your most calm and confident. And they happen to be at, you know, a receptive mode. So, you know, I think it's a question of really just developing a... And I learned this with um, runners. I've run three marathons this year, LA, San Francisco, and Chicago. And so I started um, interviewing a couple of people about running. And what one of them said was, I asked like, what's your, she knew her fastest time when she was in her 20s that got her on the Olympics. But I said, what was your, what was your fastest this time, or your fastest that time? And she goes, well, I remember, I remember in like 2003, in spring of 2003, it was, it was like, it was a really good year. I was consistently hitting like right around that thing. And it struck me that like what was most important to her, most memorable to her, wasn't one particular thing, but it was like a time period. So it's not just the one conversation, the one specific thing you say. It's like how are you operating? Are you operating in the right way over with uh, across all those conversations you're having in order to get the effect you want? I think it's probably a good thing. Yeah, I'd like to, to add to that too. Um, you know, Sean's the exception to the rule. Normally, we have access to the campaign in some way. Sean. All this login information, all that stuff is his, right? Um, so as marketers and, you know, as somebody whose job it is is to, to lighten the load of the project creator, you know, for me, there's a fine line between, you know, how do we market and automate and how do we keep it authentic? And to answer your question fully, um, from my perspective, one of the best things you can do, and I recently watched this bring in about $7,000 in a couple days for a student film. One of the best things you can do is Go on Facebook and send an instant message to each one of your friends. And you write, you copy the message that you're going to write, I'll tell you a sample. And you write, hi, their name. And then you hit Command V or Control V, paste. Okay? And the key is to write the question in a way that really is engaging. So, hey, how are you? How have you been? What are you up to? I just wanted to let you know that I've been working real hard and I have this new project. And I'd love it if you can back me with even a dollar. I'm trying to bring in all my friends to help raise the amount of money or the amount of pledges on the site. So a really personalized message that feels real, it has their name in it, and it feels like it actually was written by you, that's when it's okay to automate. And like I said, I watched it bring in $7,000 almost overnight for a Chapman student. And if you can do that, and then you can get everyone on your team to do that as well, you're going to bring in a tremendous, tremendous amount of money. You know, just by doing that. So you know, one of the challenges with that is, is that when you when you hit a couple of good Facebook, you know, uh, posts and a bunch of Twitter posts, everybody sees it. If then you start doing something, you know, you you, you do that personal yet automated thing, which is what I was just describing. It's a little like I've actually had friends write back like, "Is this spam?" Like, Todd, it's me. I just wrote you. He goes, yeah, but I saw you were doing the thing, and then you wrote this thing, and I'm like, what? <laughs> so it's, it takes, it's uh, not an exact science. It's not exact, no. <laughs> but if you do it personally and privately, you can automate it a little bit. And, you know, it tends to work, especially if you're not, you know, bugging them all the time about other stuff. So about, you know, giving you money to other things. For most people, when you're crowdfunding, this is the first time you're hitting up your friends and your family and all these people you know for money. And ideally, if you're doing it for a good reason, I'd be an asshole not to do it if a friend asked me to pledge at least a dollar to his campaign. So, you know, I think that's a, a really cool way to look at it, but private messages are great. There's a, the whole psychology of that. Like, some of my friends, I've asked them to do it, and they just haven't done it. I'm like, wow, what a bummer. And then other ones, I'm like, dude, just do like 25 bucks. And you know, two grand would be easy for the guy. But you're saying it just because you're trying to like, yeah. you know, it's, mar it's, it's salesmanship, really. So then when he goes on there and does 25 bucks, you're like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then once they're in, then they get your updates. And if you send updates all the time, and if it's exciting things, and they're seeing that you're making progress, and you're really kicking ass with it, sometimes we'll raise those pledges. And then sometimes you can even give them incentive. Like, for anyone who raises their pledge in the next hour, they get this. But even, even if they don't, mm -hmm. like the fact that I've experienced disappointment about them right. is a little misplaced. Like, they don't have to, it's like, you want to be able to have your relationships with your friends and family members beyond it. So, like, you know, it's, I always like to make it easy for somebody to say no, sort of, 
Right. So that they'll still, but then what you said is true too. There's a lot of, like, you know, it's, it's not exact science. Yeah. It's psychology, it's marketing, it's sales, and it ain't perfect. But, but you, I mean, to, yeah. what, corporate, corporate, right? I mean, I, I just started realizing, like, probably corporations, you know, could, could Exxon back my campaign legally? Could, could Exxon cut it, you know, yeah. somebody have an, would, would an Exxon executive have an uh, Amazon account? Because <laughs> right, you have to have an Amazon account. Right. Yeah, they're normal people. <laughs> no, the individuals, but the company. Right. Company cuts you like a company check or the company credit card. Company credit card would do it, yeah. And you can reach out that way. I mean, Darren's a specialist at that. You know, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to put more work on your table. Uh, but yeah, you I mean, created a whole new like uh, revenue stream there. You know, you still got to hit it. You know, with Boss Tools, we reached out to you know CEOs of tool companies, and we were like, Hey, Stephen is this awesome entrepreneur, and he's taking after you guys. You know, he's trying to create this new tool company. Can you help set him over the edge? Doesn't always work. Sometimes it does, but it's definitely a way you can go. Um, corporate sponsorships are cool, especially if you have an audience. That feeling when you want. send something to somebody like that and they respond and give you money, you're like, whoa, yeah. I can't believe they did that. It's cool, yeah. So, okay, any final questions, guys? There was someone in the back? How's Yeah, what's up? Hey, how's it going? Hey. Uh, would you do your campaign, are you able to go to other, I guess, friends and have them help you uh, contact other influencers? For example, there's like, you know, the head of your band club. It's a good question. People, people, friends and family who are, are willing to kind of activate their networks is a phrase that I've heard a lot. Um, it's so funny. I remember like a week in just thinking, I appreciate you posting it on Facebook, but can you put in 25 bucks? You know, because I think it's most effective when, when other people help you. And I haven't seen that be, it was, hasn't been effective on my campaign yet, to my knowledge. I mean, maybe it has. I've got 375 people. But when you talk about like somebody says, oh, I've got a network of 400,000 Twitter followers or people, whatever, and I'll pulse it out there, you just know if they, if they had invested because they loved it and then they went out there and kind of really passionately got them to do it, it, it might yield more. I think the, the whatever results that kind of force multiplier has had on my effect. And that's, that's what it's been. I mean, you, you talk about the head of the fan thing. I've had, I've had about seven or eight people hungry every day. Every time my name is posted in a tweet and there's some kind of question, like, oh, what about this? Or what about that? Or, hey, have you thought of this? Or whatever, they're responding to it. And they're growing their followership. So they've done it. And, and it's, I'm, I'm sure it's moved the needle. But, uh, but not like you not like you think. It's not like pushing a button and all of a sudden, at least not on this particular project. Yeah, I think if you prep them right, it makes a huge difference. I mean, this game, a lot of it has to do with leverage. How do you leverage your friends, your family, people you know? How do you get more and more people on your team? When we did Space Command, we had like 10 or 20 people on the team, and we raised like 220 grand. So, and a lot of it came from just being a great team and having a lot of leverage there. I mean, you know, another thing that really helps is, and I'm gonna single you out, Kevin. Um, Kevin runs uh, Digital LA, which it's all these events going on in Los Angeles. And he's done so many favors for so many people and put so many startups and different kinds of people in the spotlight. And now for him to be able to reach out and individually talk to people and, you know, get their, get their attention, get them on board before they launch, you can leverage the crap out of people. And I don't mean that in a bad way, I mean that in a, you know, they want to help you do something special. So I think that's the key there. Get people to help you do something special. Some people will let you log into their Facebook accounts and let you send out messages to all their friends. Some people will just give you an endorsement or a shout out. Whatever it is, you know, put people to work. And if you've done favors for people, now's a great time to cash them in. So, those are thoughts. Log into somebody else's Facebook account? <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean, to be honest, we've had, I've done stuff where we've had people say, hey, you are more than welcome to use my Facebook account. I don't have the time to email all my friends, but I'd be happy for you to do it if you want to do it. You know, invite everyone to my Facebook page.
just, I don't want to press the button, you press the button. That's kind of what happens, so. And you know, I'm willing to do it myself, I'm willing to put an intern on it and have them get in there and person, high name, copy base. Person, name, base. And just go through it. And you know, as long as the person is there to answer the questions when they respond and have an actual communication and chat, it. I think there's nothing wrong with that automation process. So, yeah. I agree with that. So I think on that note, we'll close it up. It's been a pleasure. And I'm really Thanks, thankful. Thanks, everybody. Raise your hand if you have currently a Kickstarter campaign going. Wow, two people. <laughs> That's amazing. Raise your hand if you're contemplating one. A lot more than half, but still, wow. Yeah. Are the rest of you lost? <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> You're lost. No. Oh yeah. Question. No, no. I had two Indiegogo campaigns, but I didn't have a team, so it didn't really go anywhere. And it was at a time, unfortunately, when I wasn't really all that knowing about what it took, and also, you know, I had a friend dying of cancer. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like the wrong time, and it was sort of like before I had the information. So I'm really looking forward well, I'm sorry about your friend. That's terrible. Yeah, but I mean, it just, you know, it, in the last six months to a year, I mean, I heard the, per, the one of the founders of Indiegogo talk, and it was amazing, you know, the information he had, but it's really something where you have to really, I mean, there, you have to really learn how to use the campaign, and it's not easy if you're starting out. Well, it takes, uh, I remember Phil Jackson, I got to, Talk to Phil Jackson once. Yeah. The, yeah. And uh, I said, I said, hey Phil, what was it like in Puerto Rico? He kind of looked at me. Important early days. And I think all those like false starts or failed attempts or whatever. That's just you know a pre precursor to the to the next cool thing. And I would just say one thing: it's really important to be honest. You know, sometimes if you can't. If it's not working, then maybe the friendship group you have, is, you're not going to be able to deploy them in that way. So you have to figure out something else. If you can't figure out something else for that thing, maybe that thing isn't, is not the, you know. Well, the Indiegogo uh, founder said you almost have to start like a year in advance planning out your campaign, shooting all your roll-ins, you know, all right. of that. No, There's a year? Yeah, a year. not a year. Yeah. I mean, we, no. we try and ramp up with you know, three months, two to three months, but that's because we're experts in the space and we know what we're doing. We've done it enough times where we've created a track. You know, the real key is, is, and one of the biggest mistakes I see that people do is they have a feeling that if I put it up there, people will come. Problem is, especially over the last year and a half, you know, the space has gotten really, really crowded. It's very hard to get noticed. Now, films are a lot different, radio shows are a lot different, Products and things that people got to have can get noticed, okay? People might find them on Kickstarter, especially if they're popular. But other than that, it's up to you to drive the marketing. And it's no different than if you're starting any business or if you're marketing any product. You have to drive people to the buy button. You have to drive them to your store. And if I can leave you guys with anything, is it's, it's not about if I build it and put it up there and get a Kickstarter live, people are going to show up. You have to be prepared you have to market this thing, and you have to spread the word like nobody's business to hit your goals. So I would love to leave it there. And any final thoughts, Sean? No, I just I really appreciate you guys coming out and, and uh, sitting and listening to this Kickstarter thing. I think I might have learned more than I shared, <laughs> but but uh, but I, I, I my phone vibrated. I thought it wouldn't be funny anymore if I kept raising my hand every time, but it vibrated a good 15 times while I was sitting here. So. 17. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you very much and thank you all of you online. I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Don't forget to pledge.